All right. What a great panel. Rebalancing Act, we're here to talk about, let's talk about customers because everyone has different levels, different institutional versus private wealth, and there's been so much turmoil in the markets. So I want to start, simple question, what do customers want these days? Sonia, you're my line site, so you get the, the first ah, crack. Okay. So for us, what our clients are finding very exciting right now is that we're going to be launching a sports fund soon. And that is, everyone wants to hear about it. And, and it's, it's really just in terms of it's long-term money, but it's also it's a space that everyone finds very interesting. I mean, we were talking before that risk-free money is now 5%, so you have to come up with good ideas. <laughs> That's very cool. And what, what, what are the man customers? It's all the, the millions of them. The millions of them. Yes. Um, I, for us, what we're having a lot of conversations about is actually people understanding what their portfolios look like, what risk looks like for them, um, and how they are trying to balance liquidity needs in the mix of that, so a little bit in that same space. But diversification, if you're in Europe right now, and we can talk about it later, mm -hmm. RI, or responsible investing. But, mm -hmm. but mainly, I think the other piece that is really coming to light is the need to provide bespoke solutions. So taking what you've got, understanding what your current portfolio looks like, and then saying, actually, what do I need to fill the gaps? What do I need that's going to make sense in an uncorrelated way or in a non-traditional way, or that provides me with the liquidity, that maybe increases my share, or whatever it may be. But fundamentally, much more about bespoke product um, building. Gotcha, very cool. So we work with ultra high net worth families, family offices, and high net worth investors. And they're asking us, what's going on with the geopolitical considerations in my portfolio? How should I be investing in the current rate environment, inflation? Is there going to be a potential re recession? And we've shifted to a 40-40-20 model um, for our clients, which is 40 equities, 40 fixed income, and 20 alternative and private equity holdings. On the fixed income side, obviously, we don't have to repeat it. I'm sure we've all no. seen the rates are incredibly high on treasuries and municipals, although we've been extending duration on our fixed income portfolio to longer term investment grade uh, munis and corporate bonds as well. On the equity side, shifting to dividend paying, high dividend paying stocks, that's outperformed the market by 12% over the last 18 months. Uh, and we love unstoppable industries like healthcare, like technology, particularly AI, cyber, and robotics. And we love the transition to clean energy. So a lot of the clean energy tech companies, hydrogen companies, battery companies, and the like. And on the alternatives and private equity side, lots of opportunities in private credit, uh, as well as an opportunity for a lot of the invest, uh, investment managers to take advantage of some of the market dislocation there too. And overall, from a geographic diversification standpoint, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that emerging markets are trading at a 40% discount to develop markets that the US dollar is at 50 year highs. So as an investor and as a prudent investor and fiduciary for our clients, we're gonna be positioning our clients to make sure that they're gaining on the geographic opportunities as well. You, you've all been through, you know, very, you know, you've been through the credit crisis, you've been through an amazing bull market, COVID, and let's take this, this snapshot right now. Like how is this moment, how is the mood now different and the same from what you've been experiencing from well, your clients, I, customers, and everything. I think it's interesting. I mean, we were talking, as we do before these things, because we wait a long time behind this. <laughs> and um, we have to find something to talk about. So I, I think we think it's different quite, I mean, in, this, in the shortest possible way. It's a different version of dislocation. It's a different version of liquidity. It's very different from COVID. Uh, you are seeing pieces of the puzzle come together um, post-COVID. So, you know, when we talk about corporate real estate, we might all be looking around, and I'm sure you're looking at each other, I can't see you, um, and saying how many people are backing in offices, and there are a bunch of empty office spaces, and there's a ton of money that's coming in the next little while that's going to need refinancing, and that sits on US regional banks' balance sheets. And so, so there are some hangovers in this space, but the truth is, as, as you've heard us all talk about, the geopolitical issue is different than it's ever been. The inflation and interest rate space is different. 
perhaps you'll look back at the last decade and think that was the aberration, not this one. You're going to start to see that correlation between bonds and equities still hurting, which is why it's interesting to have a 40-40 in there, and what your private equity or your liquid alt space mm -hmm. does for your clients mm -hmm. who are working in wealth. And I think it, it feels like we're in a different space and we've got different positioning needs for the next 10 years. So, I don't know, I, I mean, you agree, you disagree? By all means, pile in. Yeah, but and it's different, is it different? Are people more bullish? Are they more neutral? Like, what's the feel? What's the vibe right now? And you have very different between the institutional yeah, clients, yeah. the super wealthy clients. Everyone said that, you know, there's a whole generation that hasn't seen a bear market and how they're gonna react to it now. Like, right. what do you, you know, it's all different, but Absolutely. in what ways? Sonia, what are you seeing? Well, I mean, the credit crisis obviously was very scary. So for those of us who lived through that, I mean, it's completely different than what's happening now. And that was a matter of who's going to survive, who's not going to survive, right? If, if you had locked up money, then you were sitting in a very good spot. But if you were liquid, then that's where you got, that's where you got killed. I mean, here, I think it is true that the younger generation has never faced that type of environment. And, and I'm old enough that I was working during the 87 crash, not, not, oh. not you two. Okay. <laughs> but, but then there was also no information, right? I mean, in, in 87, there was no internet, right? We were still doing work on typewriters. We didn't have computers. So just the difference between that and the credit crisis, and then in terms of information and, and the technology and everybody knowing everything real time. And now I think it's more calm, but people definitely want us to point them in the right direction. I think, and yeah, and I I, it's, it's more confusion and unsettling in terms of, of the geopolitical risks, but we've been hearing about that for a while. Right, so everybody's waiting to to see if if that really is going to ignite. I think that's right. Yeah. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but it's that it's that sense also that you've got in that geopolitical piece. How much is going to impact your energy prices? So there was an enormous actually elasticity that we saw in energy last year. Now for Europe, that's sitting there um, with this with a war waging on their doorstep and worrying about cold winters, that was a a very different feeling and I when I, I spent my time between here and the UK but the feeling when you're sitting in the US when this is happening is it's very much a long way away and you've decoupled from energy prices with the US you sat in London and you sat in Europe and this was you know they were deeply concerning so sorry to interrupt no I was just gonna say that uh, I agree with Sonia and Robin that this is a very different environment for investors right I mean we're sitting with more certainty, more clarity on the markets than we were last year. And we've had a 10-year bull market up, up until the last 18 months of dislocation. But uh, we've reached peak rates, likely. Uh, we are going to see inflation continue to come down to hopefully about 3.5% by the end of this year. China is open. Uh, so this has many different ramifications and implications on clients' portfolios. And let's not forget that markets lead future outcomes. So we want to make sure that our investors are not sitting out on the sidelines too long um, to miss the potential rally, uh, which we think is going to happen towards the end of this year, the back end of this year. Were your clients panicking last year? Were you playing part therapist, part advisor with this recession that never came and all that stuff? What's been the, the attitudes? Steve. Interestingly, our clients are incredibly sophisticated investors, and they've been through many different market cycles. And as long as we have a very customized investment proposal that is aligned with what their longer-term family objectives are, they're not going to panic. In fact, we had very little panicking. We had repositioning, uh, which we talked about, but no panicking. Wow. So what are, the, what are the moves now? What's, what are institutional clients? What are they, besides bespoke, where are they, what are you seeing? What's, what's the smart money doing? I think that what Robin said before, diversification, right? So, so you are in a very good place if you can offer a lot of different products. Nobody, you can't go to somebody and say, this is all we have. I mean, for us, we're in Europe, we're in Asia, a lot of different businesses in the US and, and bespoke investments just in terms of, of having different categories of where an investor may want to invest. So for us, it's all long-term, but 
it's definitely diversified. Yeah, for sure. I can't, I can't say more than, I can't emphasize that more actually. Diversified, but diversified in a way that suits your portfolio. Yeah. And I'm sure you, you're, you're hearing exactly the same thing. Yeah. Understand what you're trying to achieve and understand what you're trying to achieve over the long term. When you're dealing with sovereign wealth or allocators in pension funds or endowments or annuities, whatever they may be, there's also this tension between the intergenerational equity that you're trying to build. So you have this short term, how do we service today those pensioners who have entrusted us with their money that we think about every single day that we come into work, but also next generation and the generation beyond that. How do you think about wealth and how do you think about alpha capture through those periods? And so I think there is absolutely about diversification, but it's also about that matching of your current portfolio. And you will have seen in, in, with the LDI crisis that you might have seen in the UK or with the regional bank issue that we had in the US, there is also some liquidity management that people need to really be thinking about. And there's no doubt that private equity has been enormously beneficial over the last while and that it has that role. And we would say that it's that combination of private, of liquid alts, of your long only portfolio, but ensuring you understand what it does in correlation and what it does in market moves. And I think that's what we have to do as investment managers leaning in to working with clients. By the way, the better informed they are, the better we are at what we do. And just to add on to what Robin has just said about geographic diversification, I think it's so prudent that we think about that, particularly with the ongoing bifurcation between US and China uh, relationships. And what does that mean to investors' portfolios? Where are the opportunities going forward? And as that bifurcation uh, happens, it's going to change the dynamics of the global supply chain and nearshoring, for example, with Mexico, uh, Brazil is China's largest trade partner. You know, different areas of opportunity in Southeast Asia as companies are trying to diversify as well as India. So this is obviously very important for investors to consider, again, on geographic diversification front as well. Yeah, how, are you sure. all, how are you all playing China with investments? For, for us, yeah. we're basically investing across all of Asia. And, and China is just one small piece of it. And I think the one thing that I wanted to add that, that we were talking about before is the overlay of ESG. Yeah. That yeah. whether it's the institutional <laughs> investors or like we were saying, the next generation, I mean, in terms of family offices, everyone cares about ESG. So you have to really be aligned with, with the investors and, and have a policy and really be careful yeah. in terms of, of following I think those policies. We before, Robin, what's your take on, what's your hot take on ESG right now? Not that well, it's a hot take. I, I, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting one. We, um, th there are definitely clients who put it right at the top of their list. Um, very hard to deal with anybody in the Nordics at the moment without them wanting to talk to you about sustainable investment, responsible investing, some version of that. Um, there are other countries which, quite frankly, are less interested. There may be other states that are, quite frankly, less interested right now. Um, and our positioning on this is quite simple. We're here to provide clients with solutions and with answers in their portfolios. So fundamentally, if somebody wants a responsible investing aligned portfolio, we can do that. And we do. But if you're not interested in that, then it's not for us to be sitting here evangelical it is for us to be providing answers to whatever your needs are. And I think that's an interesting piece as we see ESG, responsible investing, come about and new generations coming into the mix. Mm -hmm. You start to see an interesting change socially in this space. But in this country in particular, this has become a polarizing yeah. issue, which makes it interesting, but also quite difficult because most of us think governance, for example, it's not a bad thing to take into consideration when undertaking investing. Robin, I would just say on that, on that very point that uh, one of the areas that we see the most interest in ESG and impact investing is with our next generation of wealth clients. Yeah, for sure. um, so 15 trillion is being passed to next generation of wealth clients and what do they want? They want to invest with impact, they want to invest responsibly and they're leveraging uh, different types of ways to play the ESG spectrum, similar with women clients as well. Absolutely. You know, women control a third of the wealth today. What are their priorities? They also want to invest with purpose. So we're definitely seeing more interest going uh, there. But I don't think ESG is going to be a separate category going forward. I agree. 
I actually think it's going to be part and parcel. It's going to be integrated in the way that we're making investment decisions for our clients because these are the very companies that are going to make an impact and a positive impact for our world at large. Yeah. Oh, well, that was fast. We have one minute left. I'm going to put everyone on the spot here. Quick lightning round. Uh -oh. Give me a 15, each of you have 15 seconds. Give me a, a bold or contrarian prediction for the next, next year. Why, why am I always going first? <laughs> I start on the other. Start on the other. Fine, uh, you're, you're, in the, you're in the hut spot right now. Ida, go for it. I don't want to have a bold or contrarian, but I think that investors should buckle up for some near-term volatility, but don't sit out on the sidelines too long. You're going to miss the run-up. Oh, I think don't miss liquidity. Don't have that mismatch sitting there and not know what to do with it. Think about it. It matters. It matters because you need to manage it yourself within your portfolio, but there are going to be opportunities, and you might want to put your capital to work. So I would say be invested and don't sit on the sidelines and be diversified. Wow. That's why I'm a journalist, so I have no cash on the sidelines ever, so it's, it's really good. <laughs> um, so, one less problem. Everyone, thank you so much. We could spend an hour up there. Thank you so much. <laughs>